Tonight I have the pleasure of welcoming the Honourable Fred Cheney to Anuan country. I would like to mention that I had the same honour of welcoming him into my home at Noan village 30 years ago, when he was then the Minister of Aboriginal Affairs. As we share our knowledge of teaching, learning and research practices, may we also pay respect to the knowledge embedded forever within the Aboriginal custodianship of this country. Aboriginal people are the original custodians of the land. It is important this unique position is recognised and incorporated as part of official protocol and events to enable the wider community to share in Aboriginal culture and heritage, facilitating better relationships between Aboriginal people in the wider community. I am a descendant of the Anuan people, the traditional custodians of the land where this important event is being held today. We share the caring of this country with the Gumbanya, Dungari and Kamilaroi people. I'd like to pay respect to the elders past and present of those nations and I extend that same respect to you here tonight. And on behalf of the Anuan people, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Uncle Colin. Can I um, just say I'd like to add my own personal acknowledgement to the traditional owners and in Anuran language, which is being revived, and we thank you, there's a wonderful PhD student called Callum who's helping revive a dictionary of the Anuran language. So I'd like to just say, Utila Tanya Yunyarara, which simply translates as, I welcome you to this land. It's important that we keep this history and culture alive, and so we do really appreciate the UNE, our elders on council, the important place they part. And if I, if I may say, in 2020, we're launching our new version of our LLB degree, and it will have three strong themes throughout. One, one is ethics, you won't be surprised about that. One is around internationalization. The third core theme will be indigenous cultural context, and it will run through every area of the law. It will not be limited to sometimes such important areas just get siloed. We want to embed it so that every UNE law graduate will have this implanted, embedded in their heart and mind. You hear the Sir Frank Kiddo lecture. Some of you may not know who Sir Frank Kiddo was. For the lawyers in the room, I'm sure you're aware, he was a Justice of the High Court of Australia from 1950 to 1970. He held many other roles. He actually died in Armidale in 1994, the age of 90 years old. So why would we have an annual lecture named after him? Well, very simply, he was the Vice Chancellor from 19, sorry, the Chancellor, and this is like the Chancellor, from 1970 to 1981. So he was a long time in that very important role, hence why we celebrate him this way. And when Social Professor Greg Kahn, who coordinates our Kirby, as in the Michael Kirby series, and also the Sir Frank Kiddo lecture, was putting forward suggestions of names, and we have a number of people make suggestions. We, we sit through and feel, what is the right person for the right time? And the Honourable Fred Cheney, AO, came to mind as an ideal speaker. And obviously we're very grateful that you're here with your wife, Angela. Fred Cheney started his road in law in Western Australia as a solicitor and barrister and practiced law. He also covered the territory of PNG before entering the Senate in 1974. He was a leader for the opposition and held various ministerial portfolios, of which the most relevant today, of course, is Aboriginal Affairs and Social Security. Post his political career, he spent a little bit of time as an academic at the University of Western Australia in the Graduate School of Management as a research fellow. He was sharing earlier today that uh, academic life was not for him, and he moved straight away to the Chancellor of Murdoch University, and also, probably significantly for part of today's talk, became a member of the National Native Title Tribunal. We know its significance. He's also co-chaired the Reconciliation Australia organisation, and also been a director on the board uh, of that organisation, as well as the Consult Consultation Committee on Human Rights Acts for Western Australia. He was awarded the Officer of the Order of Australia, AO, and also the Sir Ronald Wilson Leadership Award for Exceptional Leadership. In 2014, 
he was honoured with Senior Australian of the Year. Please, I welcome the Honourable Fred Cheney. Thank you, Michael, for that introduction. And thank you for taking the trouble to say a few words in the local language. Um, unfortunately for me, having worked across the country, there are so many Aboriginal languages that I'm completely lost. So I think it's a wonderful thing to acknowledge the local community in, in their own language. And uh, I'm grateful that you've done that. Thank you very much, Colin, for your warm welcome. Um, I, I like to, I really relish Welcomes to Country. I relish the fact, since we're at a lecture that's been um, promoted by the law school, I relish the fact that when an Aboriginal person welcomes us to their country, that's not just putting an Aboriginal view, that's putting a view which is part of the common law of Australia. Post Mabo, the reality is that the local traditional owners are people with particular and peculiar rights to country. And so your welcome column is well rooted in whitefellow law as well as blackfellow law. So thank you very much. And thank you for reminding me of our earlier meeting. I'd also like to acknowledge, <coughs> excuse me, I'd like to acknowledge in the audience uh, a number of Aboriginal people and just say to you that I've been blessed over the last 60 plus years to have a lot of contact with Aboriginal people and I'm very grateful for the kindness that most of them have shown me. Some have chosen to reproach me for my inadequacies and those reproaches have always been appropriate. But it is a wonderful set of cultures that we have, these First Nations cultures, and Andrew and I and our children have been huge beneficiaries uh, of those cultures. The um, lecture, as you've been told, is uh, honouring a distinguished counsel, a High Court Justice and long-serving Chancellor of the University, this university, Sir Frank Kitto. Um, I'm not going to say a lot about Sir Frank Kitto, although I do wish to quote him in a minute, but um, those of you who are interested, uh, the person who's given this lecture almost incessantly is uh, Michael Kirby, another retired High Court judge who tells me that he's given it five times and wants to give it another five times. <laughs> Which I think just shows what a bloody optimist he is. Because <laughs> he's like me of a fairly advanced age. But in fact, the matter he, he, in his last lecture last year, which I watched on the university website, there's a lovely description of Sir Frank Kiddo, and I commend it to you. It's a great honour to be asked to deliver the lecture. Thank you very much. And in the past, it's been delivered in the main by judges, both of whom seem to have come from our highest court. And uh, that's a very difficult thing for me because I've never been a judge. I practised law for only 10 years, from 1964 to 1974. And although I think I was handy enough as a practitioner, I don't think anybody ever described me as a distinguished lawyer. Um, so, wisely or not, the university asked me if I, I would call myself a sometime lawyer, a politician, a statutory office holder, and a very active citizen to address you, and they asked me to speak on an indigenous topic with which I'm familiar. Now, the problem with being asked to give a lecture a long time in advance is that it keeps coming in your head and you think, oh, I might talk about this, I might talk about that. And we chose this lovely generic topic about the long road to Uluru and beyond. Uh, but in fact, uh, as I thought about it, and thought about the long, and it is a long road to Uluru, <coughs> the long road to indigenous recognition, uh, it really kept striking me that almost any area of social reform is a long road. And it can be very discouraging. Now, there are people from Antar here, some of whom I'm really grateful that some of you have turned up. Thank you very much. Um, you would remember this has been a long road for reconciliation. And the road never seems to quite end. But that led me to think quite a lot about that. And in the end, I thought, I'm going to really give a talk about the long road to any reform and improvement. 
And I really want to say something about my own optimism about reform. Because changing what's wrong has always been my abiding public interest. And it explains why I left the law for politics. Um, my preference for politics can be very understood by something that was said by Justice Kitto. He said that his role, the judge's role, is, and I quote, not to be defined as a duty to decide fairly, but as a duty to decide correctly. Now, that's the end of the quote, and in my view that's an entirely accurate statement. It reflects a famous quotation from the Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court, who was greeted by one of his fellow judges, Judge Levin Hand, with the words, good morning, judge, do justice. And Holmes responded that his job was not to do justice, but to administer the law. Now, I agree with Sir Frank and with the Chief Justice Holmes' views. That's the rule of law. And that's why it ensures we live in a free society. We have a government of laws and not of men. In practice, I understood my own role as a lawyer to ensure that my client got his or her rights according to law. But I often found that a rather painful experience, particularly when it was painful for my client, because I couldn't necessarily get a fair answer or a right answer for my client. All I could get was the best outcome the law would allow, and sometimes the law is oppressive and unfair. Now what's attractive about political life, and I can almost smell the scepticism in this audience that there could be anything attractive about political life, but the attractive thing for me was that you actually in politics can try for the right answer. When you think something's wrong, your job is to say, well, what can we do about this? What is the right answer to this thing? And then you try to change the law. And in my political life, didn't like the politics all that much, but I certainly liked the search for right answers. And in, in my time in Parliament, I thought that legislation like the Racial Discrimination Act, the Land Rights Act, the Native Title Act, and various laws that we passed to expand the rights of the citizen against the state were contributions to getting better answers than the previous law provided. Now, there were to be some undergraduate law students here. Are there any here? Oh, what a relief to see you. <laughs> There's Morgan and Morgan. That's so nice. Um, I want to say a few things that are relevant, perhaps particularly to law students, but which I hope won't be of total non-interest to the rest of the audience. Um, I got a rather poor past degree in law. I got a poor past degree because I fell in love with a woman sitting in the front row <laughs> on her first day at university, and I fell madly in love with her, and I thereafter studied Angela Clifton. <laughs> and I, got a, I reckon I got a PhD in Angela Clifton. And it served me very well, but I got a very poor past degree in law. But it was so bad that when I was in government and still getting promoted, I thought, what if they offered me the Attorney General's job? And I thought, conscientiously, I have to refuse that, because I'm not a good enough lawyer to be the Attorney General. But one of the real pluses of my working life is that I've worked with the most wonderful lawyers. And although Sir Frank Kiddo was absolutely right in what he said, and although the lawyers I've worked with and the judges I've worked with have all followed that rule, they've also demonstrated an enormous interest in trying to find the right answer when it's outside the law. So I've had the privilege of working with Sir Robert Wilson, who was High Court Judge, John Tui, High Court Judge, Bob French, the recent High Court Chief Justice. Not because I was a hotshot lawyer, but because they, like me, were really determined to see better answers for Indigenous Australia. And all I can say is that the great thing that I would recommend to those of you who are law students in this audience is hang around the best people you can find. And that includes in your practice, but also in your pursuit of just solutions. Because undoubtedly, my association with lawyers of that calibre, far superior to me in their 
intellects and in their capacities as lawyers has actually lifted my capacity to do what I thought needed to be done. And I offer these stories about working with these people as a consolation, really, because perhaps some of you don't think you're going to make it to the High Court. Perhaps some of you, like me, will get a past degree and not an honours degree, although that seems to be almost a thing of the past these days. But if you get a very good wife at the cost of an honours degree, I can assure you the trade-off is worthwhile. <laughs> So I, I want to, as well as acknowledging the people who are here tonight, and the Aboriginal people who are here tonight, and the Antar people who are here tonight, and the university people who are here tonight, I want to acknowledge the lawyers who have enriched my life. I want to acknowledge those High Court judges, Hal Wharton, who I'll be seeing in Sydney the day after tomorrow, Danny Gilbert, ditto, Mark Liebler, and Bob Ellicott. These are lawyers who have really worked in the interests of Indigenous Australians to whom I owe an enormous debt. Now the second <coughs> thing that I want to talk about tonight is that reform is always possible, however difficult it might seem. And I think that it is possible when you're an enthusiast for getting change to start to despair. It all seems too hard and too slow. And if you think of today's difficult policy concerns and the apparent lack of movement, think climate change, Think stagnant wages. Think of the balance between security and liberty. Think of refugee issues. Think of official corruption. Think of homelessness, drug abuse, and addiction, domestic violence, child abuse. One could go on. There are things in Australia today that really need attention and which seem to take a lot of time to fix. And in this genuinely lucky country, there's no shortage of issues for reform and improvement. And if you are struggling with any of those issues, you might ask the question, are we making progress? Is progress possible? And Indigenous Australians in particular, who are entitled to be aghast at the time it's taken to come to grips with constitutional recognition, might ask the same question. Now, I really want to be positive tonight, because there's nothing worse than coming to a lecture and going, I think, oh God, everything's terrible. <laughs> Everything's not terrible. And I was really touched by a book I read while I was thinking about this lecture called The Land Before Avocado. It's a really interesting book. It's written by a man called Richard Glover. And of course it plays on the fact that the young generation, those layabout students down the back and the avocado generation, <laughs> they put getting smashed avocado for breakfast ahead of buying a house. That's the sort of riff that riffs off that idea. But the fact of the matter is that what he does is to document the changes in Australia over a substantial part of my working lifetime and record some of the changes that have occurred in areas such as the status of women, the legal position of gays, our approach to the environment, the position of Indigenous Australians, and even our eating and drinking habits. And it reminds us that in the past, in all those areas, the past was comparably bleak. In areas like this, the past is indeed a foreign country. Older members of this audience will have their own examples, but my school teacher's sister, for example, had to resign when she married. There were a whole lot of ways in which women were treated grossly unfairly. My gay friends and relations at that time lived in fear of violence, prosecution and imprisonment. We were casually careless about the environment. And what about my area of close interest, Indigenous affairs? Well, I'll tell you what I remember about that past foreign country. I remember a brutally segregated society, segregated de facto and de jure. My teenage memories of the position of Aboriginal people in my state of Western Australia in the 1950s and 60s remains very sharp and motivates me <coughs> today. They were excluded from the normal benefits of being Australians. They were denied the vote and the other civil liberties afforded generally to others. They were often confined to reserves and they lived in humpies, tin sheds and car bodies. They were casually prostituted and abused. They were denied education and employment and they were treated with overt contempt beyond the racism we still see today. I was talking to some people in the audience who said they've just seen the Adam Goods film. 
And that's a painful reminder of the persistence of racism. And we hate as Australians having it drawn to our attention, but it's there. And it's something that we have to continue to work on. What I saw as a school student in the 1950s and then as a university student was the frequent denial of decent treatment and equality of citizenship for Indigenous people. And I particularly mentioned the idea we're all equal, the idea of equal citizenship, because that important idea is part of why constitutional recognition is contentious to some of our fellow Australians. Yet it was that principle that drove the reforms um, and the, the brought about positive changes in the legal positions of Aboriginals. Australia is a much better place today for Indigenous Australians than the Australia of my youth. And even a partial list of the changes is a reminder that change is possible. Voting rights were legislated in 1962. And I say to students present, the University Liberal Club, of which I was a member at that time, made a submission for voting rights to the Parliamentary Committee at that time. We knew that denial of rights was wrong and needed to be changed. The overwhelming vote for the 1967 referendum, which whatever its technical achievements, was really about the whole nation agreeing to equal citizenship. It was the Commonwealth acceptance of the need to support Indigenous culture and connection to land and the need for special services in 1972 in the last Liberal budget. Billy McMahon, hopeless Prime Minister, quite hopeless, at the end of his tether, but his last budget actually provided for land purchases, culture and Aboriginal services. Whitlam, of course, came in and expanded that hugely. We had then the uh, exposure of the unique Aboriginal connection to land in the Gove land case in 1972. That led to the Woodward inquiries and the all-party support for land rights legislation in 1976 all party support for the Racial Discrimination Act in 1975, implementation of land rights legislation in South Australia and New South Wales, and more modestly in Queensland and Victoria during the 1980s. The point I'm making here is that none of those things came easily. None of them came quickly. They actually required focused and long-term effort. So today I share the current concerns about the continuing gaps in life expectancy, education and employment, the horrific rates of imprisonment and family separation, and the shameful neglect and oppression of the remote communities with which I work. But history tells us, our experience tells us, that we can change these things if we really want to. Now the really big breakthrough in this whole Indigenous, non-Indigenous relationship area was the High Court Mabo decision in 1992, which was the most extraordinary uh, development. It recognised the unique and different status of Indigenous Australians as holders of native title. Their connection to land through their law and culture, now recognised in the Common Law and the Native Title Act, is a connection uniquely different from the connection the rest of us can have, however much we say we love our country and our particular piece of it. This particular difference of indigenous collective identities, tribes if you like, nations if you like, having identified rights at law, sits alongside the now equal citizenship of the individual members of those culturally based collectives. In that important way, Australians are not all the same. Only indigenous Australians can have land rights or native title. Only they can own and maintain the world's oldest living cultures. Indigenous Australia is not just another ethnic minority in this very diverse country in which we live, but they're a distinct and continuing part of our nation. Now, coincident with the recognition of the collective identities of First Nations through legislation, agreement making, native title, we've also seen a huge growth in an Indigenous middle class. There are now lawyers, judges, academics, doctors, nurses, business people, tradespersons, public servants, and we couldn't have even dreamed of that 40, 50 years ago. But it's a fantastic achievement of individual Aboriginal people. But we're talking tonight about something different. We're talking about their collective rights as Aboriginal peoples, not just their rights as individual Australian citizens. Now, these slowly won changes have had very 
different degrees of opposition depending on whether they affirm sameness or difference. Australians voted almost unanimously in 1967. 90% of us voted yes for some ill-defined but generally understood idea of equal citizenship. Almost every Australian wants the social and economic gaps closed. For changes pursued based on the pursuit of equality, there's general goodwill in the Australian community. For changes based on issue, issues like land rights, native title and constitutional recognition, all have excited passionate opposition from some in the community. So why is there the difference between a 90% yes vote in 1967 and perhaps a current 65% favourable response to recognition in the Constitution. And I think it's important to understand why, and I think it's pretty clear why. The notion of equal citizenship fits the Australian instinct, the spirit of Australia. We like to say we're all equal and to oppose differ differential treatment. It's the idea that someone can play an enduring difference that some Australians can't accept. So along with others fighting today for gender equality, for decisive action on climate change and all the other things we're trying to deal with, it's important to stop occasionally, take a pause, note that change is possible, even inevitable. It just takes time and consistent effort. In the world of Google and the web, we all expect instant results. And societies don't change in an instant. Now that brings me, at last, to constitutional recognition the Uluru Statement from the Heart. It's been a very long road to constitutional recognition and as yet no end is in sight. Now this is, there's not the time this evening to describe the whole journey, but various demands for and, and provision of uh, recognition flow through the Prime Ministerships of Whitlam, Fraser, Hawke, Keating, Howard, Gillard, Abbott and Turnbull right through to Morrison. For those of you who want to better understand the history, the Referendum Council, which was established by Turnbull and Shorten in December 2015, and which reported in 2017, has a really excellent summary of the history. And its final report brings all that together along with the outcomes of earlier work. In the course of the journey, proposals have included a possible preamble, which was what John Howard suggested, let's put a preamble in the Constitution, it's been suggested there should be a constitutional prohibition of racial discrimination. We should remove and replace section 50, 52, class 26 of the Constitution and remove section 23. But the interesting thing about all these proposals which have floated up is that there has been a genuine reason for constitutional conservatives, including those supported with some form of recognition, to see a problem. They've seen the risk of unintended consequences, such as disturbing the balance between Parliament and the courts, giving too much power to unelected judges. They've seen difficulties in how a future activist High Court might interpret a rewording of the race power or the reach of a new preamble. And they are not racist objections, they are constitutional objections. Now I want to quote to you what the co-chairs of the Referendum Council said in part in their foreword. They said, this report builds on the work of the expert panel, which I was a member of, I interpolate, and the Joint Select Committee. It takes into account the political and legal responses of the earlier reports and the views of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and the general public. Then explains that something unique happened under the work of the Referendum Council. For the first time, Aboriginal people were given their own opportunity for a constitutional convention. And that was a requirement that was put on them. They were required specifically to consult with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people on their views on meaningful recognition. And that's the first time in Australia's history that such a process has been undertaken. And what they go on to say is that the findings of our broader community, that's our concentration of non-Aboriginal people, non-ATSI people, supported the findings of the First Nations regional dialogues. This strengthens our conviction that the voice to Parliament proposal an extra constitutional declaration of recognition will be acceptable to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and to the broader Australian community. 
We propose these reforms because they conform to the weight of views of First Peoples expressed in the First Nations regional dialogues as well as those of the wider community. With focused political leadership and continued multi-party support for meaningful recognition, the voice to Parliament proposal can succeed at a referendum. The consensus view of the Referendum Council is that these recommendations for constitutional and extra-constitutional recognition are modest, reasonable, unifying and capable of attracting the necessary support of the Australian people. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I happen to be an enthusiastic supporter of the Uluru Statement. I'm told there was a distinguished Aboriginal speaker here a couple of weeks ago, Lyle Munro Jr., who has another view. So there are varieties of views. However, I think it's important to note that the Uluru Statement was not directed to the parliaments of Australia or the governments of Australia, but to the people of Australia. And rather than just comment on it, I intend to read it to you. And you will all make your own judgments and responses to it. This is what they said. We gathered at the 2017 National Con Constitutional Convention, coming from all points of the southern sky, make this statement from the heart. Our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander tribes were the first sovereign nations of the Australian continent and its adjacent islands, and possessed it under our own laws and customs. This our ancestors did according to the reckoning of our culture from the creation, according to the common law from time immemorial, and according to science more than 60,000 years ago. This sovereignty is a spiritual notion, the ancestral tie between the land or Mother Nature and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples who were born therefrom remain attached thereto and must one day return thither to be united with our ancestors. This link is the basis of the ownership of the soil, or better, of sovereignty. It's never been ceded or extinguished and coexists with the sovereignty of the Crown. How could it be otherwise? that people possessed a land for 60 millennia and sacred links disappears from world history in merely the last 200 years. With substantive constitutional change and structural reform, we believe this ancient sovereignty can shine through as a fuller expression of Australia's nationhood. Now, I want to make a comment before I read the rest of the statement. There'll be people in this audience who might be repelled by that and say, well, that's all just fine words. What we really need to do, and I hear people saying this, I hear politicians saying it, I hear people who make submissions to the Joint Select Committee on these matters saying it, shouldn't we just be concerned with practical matters? Isn't that what matters? Isn't the, aren't the issues around closing the gaps the only things that matter? And this is what the Uluru Statement says. Proportionally, we are the most incarcerated people on the planet. We are not an innately criminal people. Our children are aliened from their families at unprecedented rates. This cannot be because we have no love for them. And our, <clears throat> our youth languish in detention in obscene numbers. They should be our hope for the future. Now, if my voice breaks when I read that, it's because I think this is so important and so powerful what they are saying to us. They say, these dimensions of our crisis tell plainly the structural nature of our problem. There is the torment of our powerlessness. We seek constitutional reforms to empower our people and take a rightful place in our own country. When we have power over our destiny, our children will flourish. They will work, walk in two worlds and their culture will be a gift to their country. We call for the establishment of the First Nations voice enshrined in the Constitution. Makarata is the culmination of our agenda, the coming together after a struggle. It captures our aspiration for a fair and truthful relationship with the people of Australia a better future for our children based on justice and self-determination. We seek a Makarata Commission to supervise a process of agreement making between governments and First Nations and truth-telling about our history. 
1967 we were counted, 2017 we seek to be heard. We leave base camp and start our trek across this vast country. We invite you to walk with us in a moment in a movement of the Australian people for a better future. Well, I'm an unashamed supporter of those sentiments. They accord with my practical experience of dealing with issues with Aboriginal people over 60 years. There is nothing romantic in this. This is an eminently practical suggestion where Aboriginal people, Islander people, wish to be responsible for their own circumstances. It's a heartfelt plea to the people of Australia. It's a profound act of Indigenous leadership that tells us how to reset our relationship and points the way to how we can more effectively close the social and economic gaps. It's in accord with all we've learned over the last 50 years and is consistent with current government policies with respect to closing the gap. From a constitutional viewpoint, point, it strips out all of the genuine constitutional issues that have been raised with respect to previous proposals for recognition. It removes the risk of unintended consequences, such as disturbing the balance between Parliament and the courts, and how a future activist High Court, if we ever get another one, might interpret rewording the race power or the reach of a new preamble. Previous reform proposals were set aside by the Uluru Statement from the heart and all of the concerns of conservative constitutionalists were thereby met. Now, it's been a really interesting thing to follow the post-Uluru Statement history. My sense from dealing with many of those who participated in it was that many of them, many of the participants in the Uluru Convention expected to be greeted with thanks for eliminating what could genuinely concern constitutional conservatives. However, instead, the statement, instead of the statement of the heart being greeted with a claim, it was met by an absurd misinterpretation led by Barnaby Joyce that Uluru was proposing a third chamber of parliament, words which were then followed by the Prime Minister at the time and many others. Barnaby, to his great credit, has apologised. He understands that he was misunderstanding the whole thing. He's, he's been man enough to apologise, and we should be grateful for that. But unfortunately, the straw man was created and the well of the debate was poisoned. Now, the formal reply by the Turnbull government was dismissive of the voice to Parliament on the basis that it was not capable of winning acceptance to a referendum, which is quite contrary to the view of the Referendum Council, by the way. It was based on the fact that all citizens have equal civil rights and can be elected to Parliament, and the voice is inconsistent with this principle. It queried how the diversity of in Indigenous circumstances and experience could be fairly or democratically represented. However, in what was basically, I thought, a rather stupid statement, there were some more positive things in it. The statement said this, and this was delivered by the previous Prime Minister. We have listened to the arguments put forward by the proponents of the voice, and both understand and recognise the desire for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians to have a greater say in their own affairs. We acknowledge the values and the aspirations which lie at the heart of the Uluru Statement. People who ask for a voice feel voiceless or feel like they're not being heard. We remain committed to finding effective ways to develop stronger local voices and empowerment of local people. And they went on to say, our goal should be to see more Aboriginal Torres Strait Islanders serving in the House and the Senate, members of a parliament elected by all Australians. I want to deal briefly with that last point, because that's another furphy, another straw man. It's an admirable goal to have more Aboriginal and Islander people in parliament. I support that. The only party political work I've done since I resigned from my party in 1995, has been to work for an Aboriginal candidate because he's a friend and I want to see him elected to Parliament. He's now the current Minister for Indigenous Affairs, Ken Wyatt. But the fact of the matter is when Aboriginal people are elected to Parliament, and they are under the Labor banner and the Liberal banner these days, and thank God for that, when they sit on the front bench, as they do today, and thank God for that, they're not elected to represent Aboriginal people. 
They're elected to represent all of us. And of course, they're bound by their party rules and by the rules that apply to cabinet and shadow cabinet. And they cannot purport to be the voice of Aboriginal people. They must speak for their party and for the government, for the opposition, if that's what they are. So it's a ridiculous thing to say that Ken or any of the other Aboriginal people in the parliament can be the voice for Indigenous Australians. Their electorates would be entitled to be outraged. They said, we're only here to be the voice for Indigenous Australia. Now, what I think is really encouraging is the fact that despite that knockback and despite the government's rejection for the moment of the constitutional recognition of a voice, commendably, the new Scott Morrison government has shown it's committed to ongoing consideration of how Indigenous people achieve a voice and empowerment. Funds have been allocated some seven and a half million dollars, I think, for a co-design process that is designed between the government and the indigenous communities, while currently stepping back from the constitutionally environment and shrine voice. So that's a real positive that can be built on. And I think even more significantly, last December, the Commonwealth responded positively to requests by national indigenous peak bodies. That's the organizations that work with Aboriginal people in health, in welfare, in, in legal aid, all of those different areas, that all governments, they ask that all governments move away from the traditional top-down, governments know best approach of Council of Australian Governments with, report, with respect to closing the gap and to work in partnership. Now, I'd have to say the record of governments has been almost uniformly top-down. We know what's best, we'll tell you what to do, and you will do what we say. Now, it's quite remarkable that the present Prime Minister, and I'm not making this as a partisan statement, I mean, this is just a statement of fact, met with the peak bodies in his office, got the department in and said, we're going to do this differently. And in December, at the Council of Australian Governments meeting, all the governments of Australia agreed to be guided by the principles of empowerment and self-determination. They recognise, and I quote from their um, release, they recognise that in order to effect real change, governments must work collaboratively and in genuine formal partnership with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as, I really emphasise these words, they are the essential agents of change. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people must play an integral part in the making of the decisions that affect their lives. This is critical closing the gap. But this is all the governments of Australia speaking, ladies and gentlemen. What they are saying is that those in the pursuit of equality in closing the gap, it is essential that Aboriginal people's voices are there and that they are engaged because they are the key players. Now, in December, the Council of Australian Governments committed to the establishment of a formal partnership with ATSI people through their representatives by the end of February 2019. And they committed to place-based responses and regional decision-making. Now, as promised, the partnership agreement was signed in February of this year. Now, I have a copy of the partnership with me, but um, I don't have time to go through the details. And whatever fine words are put on paper, I'd have to say in the past, Fine words are often not met by fine actions. But, as is always the case, implementation of what has been agreed will be the challenge. Because for governments to act in true partnership requires them to put aside their traditional top-down approaches and have legal and administrative frameworks that permit genuine partnerships. But on this occasion, I think there is room for hope and indeed optimism about implementation, big as that challenge is. The Honourable Ken Wyatt is the first Indigenous Federal Minister for, Aboriginal, for Indigenous Affairs. We can take additional comfort from the fact that at least two Ministers of the Council of Governments, the Honourable Ken Wyatt and his cousin, the Honourable Ben Wyatt, are on the government side of the table as Ministers for Indigenous Affairs. But even more important, the partnership agreement establishes a Ministerial Council to oversee the whole government closing the gap process. 
And that ministerial council is going to be set up, established with an equal number of representatives from peak indigenous organisations and ministers and, and bureaucrats. And the council will have two co-chairs, one a ministerial representative and one a representative agreed by the peaks. Now the federal minister is chairing it, that's Kim Ken Wai, who's indigenous, and the other chair is Pat Turner, who is an indigenous person from Central Australia, a deeply experienced bureaucrat and a deeply experienced leader of non-government organisations. So, hence my hope. But even if governments live up to the partnerships, one of the sort of next concerns to put on the table is whether it's possible to structure a national voice, what Uluru is asking for, that takes into account the real desire of the multitude of diverse local voices to be heard. Now in the end, it's for indigenous people to say how their voices can be structured because it's their voice. But the fact of the matter is that what I hear indigenous people, with whom I work, and I work with quite a lot of them, is that they want their local say in the decisions that affect their lives. And they want acceptance that without their active involvement in policy and administration, nothing will change. In other words, they want their local voice to be the critical thing in terms of how governments deal with them. And this means having a real say in the design and delivery of policies affecting them. Now some see that multiplicity of local voices as a barrier. I see it as enabling. Local voices must be heard because there are huge regional differences across Australia. I can assure Colin, I can assure you that the people I work with in the central desert have a very different circumstance from the people who live in your region. It's true across Australia. You see that beautiful map of Australia with the different tribes is a reminder of how varied the circumstances are. Different regions have different histories, they have different economies, different social conditions, including in education, employment, housing and access to services. There is no one size fits so all local fits all, so local partnerships involving the community at all levels of government are essential. If the partnerships promised by COAG are put in place, the local voices demanding to be heard will be able to heard on all the issues affecting their communities. And in my view, this will enable a national voice, not impede it. What will be needed additionally, nationally, the addition to those place-based partnerships is an authentic, indigenous accepted national voice that talks to the parliament on the national as against the regional and local issues. Issues like native title, racial discrimination, heritage protection, legislation directed at Indigenous people, and whether governments live up to their common commitment to partnership are all matters of national rather than local concern, and you need a national voice. Now the fact is, we've, we've arrived at a point where there are no real constitutional reasons for not accepting constitutional recognition of the sort requested by the Uluru Statement from the Heart. Two retired Chief Justices of the High Court, Gleeson and French, have confirmed there are no constitutional problems inherent in a constitutionally entrenched voice to Parliament. They are supported in that by other lawyers, including Professor Antumi, and leading legal practitioners, including John <coughs> Gilbert and Mark Liebler. A voice to Parliament can be mandated in the Constitution, while parliamentary supremacy is preserved as well as the balance between the High Court and the Parliament. The form of the voice remains within the legislative power of the Parliament, and the process of co-design is to ensure that what is acceptable to Parliament is also seen as legitimate by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. The equal citizenship of all Australians will be preserved, as will be the present and future reality, that the collective identities of our First Nations continue to exist to have a unique place in our nation. That reality has not gone away in New Zealand, United States, Canada and Scandinavia. Indigenous recognition has not destroyed equal citizenship in those successful nations. I titled this address The Long Road to Uluru and Beyond. That's because we are now beyond the delivery of the statement to us. 
and there's much to be done. Recognition through a voice to Parliament, a Makarata Commission and truth telling. They're all on the agenda and in various ways in different parts of the country are being pursued. But a firm foundation has been laid for the future in the commitments by all governments and Council of Australian Governments to the principle of partnership. You can't have partnerships where one partner can't be heard. Once it's accepted by governments that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are the key players in closing the gap, the need for them to have voices and to be heard is beyond argument. In the Council of Australian Governments, practical matters are trumping ideology over, over, um, about recognition. There are still people, as I'm going to find and finish on the point, there are people who will oppose whatever is put up. But the fact is there is no logical reason and the Council of Australian Governments and all their difference, Labor, Liberal, very diverse in their approaches, have all agreed that it's the Aboriginal people, the Islander people, who are the essential people who are involved if we achieve the practical income, outcomes that governments want. There is a practical need for the voice. And I want to finish by giving you Fred's theory on why there is still resistance. It seems to me there are a minority of Australians who still cleave to the notion of terra nullius, who want Indigenous Australians to forget their unique identities, to forego the world's oldest living cultures, to meet the 1930s idea of disappearing into the wider white communities. They hold to the notion of assimilation rather than integration. It is that attitude that underlies the objection to any form of constitutional recognition. And that is why there will never be perfect consensus on the way ahead. And I think Ken Wyatt is wrong in thinking that he can get a consensus solution because I think there will always remain a rump of people who, for their own reasons, believe that the best thing would be to go back to assimilation, smooth the pillow of the dying race, and see them disappear. Well, I think that attitude ignores both history and reality. History shows that the indigenous people displaced do not give up their identities, however kindly or cruelly we demand that of them. History shows that from settlement we've differentiated them and legislated about them. History shows that whatever we've done, they have survived. I mean, it is a miracle that the people among whom I live, the Noongars, have survived after everything we did. It is a bloody miracle. So, post Marvo, Collective identities of our Indigenous nations, our First Nations, are part of the legal framework of our shared country. They are not going to go away. They are not going to give up their identities. It's time for us to listen to the message from Uluru and to act on it. And it's time perhaps for us to hurry on. Thank you. I think we've heard an amazing presentation from the heart, the level of authenticity that Red Chain brought to that long road and the essence of uh, the future. Um, Mr. Channing is quite happy to take some questions. Uh, we have a limited time frame. Um, so if you'd like to be at the microphone, um, oh, some hands are already popping up. Um, so would you like to go first? My name's Daniel Dixon, I'm an Aboriginal man. Um, as an Aboriginal person, I'm in support of a lot of the things that are in the Uluru Statement, the sentiments, and also two of the proposed um, reforms, i.e. the a treaty process and the truth-telling process, but I don't support the proposal for a constitutionally entrenched advisory body. Um, there's a whole variety of problems with that um, proposal, I think. Um, what I'd like to... Speak very clearly. Um, what I'd like to ask about uh, is based on um, what you mentioned about Aboriginal people in the Parliament currently being unable to 
uh, truly represent our own people due to the due to being tied to um, particular parties. Uh, what your thoughts are on um, designated seats, say in the federal Senate, um, which is already constitutionally permissible, um, as an alternative model to another, just another advisory body uh, this time in the constitution. I think that's an interesting proposition, and I think there are Maori reserve seats. I think in New Zealand, so it's not an unprecedented thing. I think, given the way politics operates in Australia and the tightness of numbers and so on, to have dedicated seats for Indigenous people would in fact be quite destructive, potentially, in, in a lot of circumstances, the way Australian politics works. So, personally, I don't think that is the better way to approach it. And it's interesting that that proposition is not, as far as I know, an attractive widespread Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander support, although you, and you, that is your particular view. So um, I, think, I think that's a mistake. The reason why I think a voice to parliament really matters is that uh, two, two reasons I can give you quickly. One is that when I was minister, or oh, a very long time ago, long before you were even thought of, um, before your parents, I have had sexual relations, in fact, because it's so long ago. <laughs> but uh, the, I had the advantage of something called the National Aboriginal Conference, and that was an elected body, and it gave me very frank advice. It even went off to the United Nations and actually it said how hopeless I was and how hopeless my government was, actually, so they were pretty brutal. But I'd have to say they were fantastic, and I was hugely aided by having that access to a voice of that sort. But the thing that really struck me was the intervention. Now, I'm not a fan of the intervention. You know what I'm talking about, the intervention of the Northern Territory. The intervention was based on a report called The Little Children Are Sacred. That report, and I'm very flattered by this, they started with a quotation from me, actually, which I was pretty delighted because I was very I think Pat Anderson, who wrote that report, along with a lawyer, um, you know, got the message pretty right. That was used as an excuse for the intervention, which involved the Howard government bringing in, I think it was 500 pages of legislation, and putting it through the parliament in a day. Now, I think that was a gross abuse of parliament, and it produced the most Huge, the hugest interventions in Aboriginal people, which have produced bugger all in a positive sense. And I think that you do need mechanisms whereby Aboriginal people, on something that can be as brutal and as powerful as the intervention, needs to be heard. So I think it's actually a very practical, from my point of view as a past practitioner of politics of government, I think it's an eminently good thing to have in, in the Constitution. And it goes on because the Labour Party came in and I thought they would fix the intervention, and in my view they made it worse. I thought the Stronger Futures legislation was introduced by the Labour government. I, they showed it to me before it was finalised, and I said, I think this is Stalinist. Stalinist in the sense that it permitted endless bureaucratic interference in the lives of Aboriginal people. So I think the fact that Aboriginal people are not heard on these matters is really very important. And that's why I'm enthusiastic for it. I'm totally respectful, of course, of your view, and you might find you know, New Zealand support for it, but I think Australian politics, it, I just don't think it would work. That's my personal view. So I'm Glenn Lear, I'm a proud Wadri man, I'm one of the five Indigenous barristers in New South Wales Bar. Um, my question um, is, in respect of Makarata, I, um, I share your views that we'll never get a consensus, but I think that one of the areas and one of the things that concerns me, as you would know, of course, more than I do, Makarata came from the dialogues, it wasn't even part of the original plan that came out from the Indigenous people. And my question you pose is, is that, uh, is that we're getting it the wrong way around, and it's, through truth telling and through a truth telling commission, that some of those that are still in opposition, either through ignorance, um, be they Barnaby Joyce or anyone else for that matter, um, may well change their attitude and change their mind through that process. I, for one, would like to see constitutional reform, but I don't know that I could cope with another setback, um, which is part of a long litany of setbacks, of which some of them mentioned tonight. I'll be interested in your thoughts about that. 
Well, I think in a way what you're saying demonstrates the, the wisdom of the people who put this together in the, in the Aboriginal Constitutional Convention because I think they're interlinked, as you say. I think truth telling is an integral part of getting a sort of social changes of social attitudes and so on. I'm really rather proud of the Makarata reference because uh, when we were in government before you were born, you too probably. And can I say how delightful it is? Can I say how delightful it is to me to have a living embodiment of what I said about Aboriginal people being in all these positions? I mean, it's, you know, it makes an old man very happy. I can tell you. But um, we, the National Aboriginal Conference, wrote to us uh, a phrase of government talking about and said they wanted to enter into treaty discussions. And we wrote back and said, okay that we were open to do that. But we did ask them, and I asked them specifically, I said, can you drop the word treaty? Because we had lunatics in government like Yogi Peterson and Charlie Court. I mean, lunatics in this area, they were brilliant men in other respects, of course, and good Christians too. But, <laughs> but the fact of the matter is that we said, please use another word, because what you've got are this, these right-wingers who will say, you're dividing the country, a country going to blah, blah, you know, you, you know the arguments. It was hot political stuff in those days. And it was the National Aboriginal Conference that came up with the Makarata word, which is the all new word, and it's repeated in the Referendum Council. It's a coming together after a fight. Now, the interesting thing about Makarata and agreement making is that if you talk treaty, it does excite certain passions. Agreement making is almost totally non-contentious. In my state of Western Australia, which has got a really pretty brutal record in Indigenous affairs, the Noongar people came together ultimately under a single Noongar claim, the, the different Noongar groups, and they won on a very unlikely first instance case over Perth. In my view, very, I'm not sure it would have withstood appeal. With their great credit, the government sat down and said, let's find an answer to this. And they negotiated the South West Land Settlement Agreement, which is huge. And yes, it involves foregoing native title, but in return, there is a permanent recognition of Noongar people as the people of the country. It, the, the agreement's worth about $1.2 billion. It involves land, it involves involvement in land administration, parking, and so on and it involves permanent structures for the Noongar nations. I mean, again, as if, if you told me this when I was a kid, I said, never. That has been uncontentious in Western Australia, except among the Noongars. And uh, in deference to your point, having a different view, that agreement is under challenge in the courts at the moment, and you would know that, um, because there's a dissident group of Noongars who say that Basically, you've got to all agree or no one agrees. Well, the chance of having all the Noongars, and there are 37,000 of them, they're a big mob, having them agree on anything is ridiculous any more than, you know, the two and a half million non-Aboriginal people are going to agree on everything. So, there's some really important issues still being fought out there, but my point in response to your question is, I think, to agree, truth-telling is an intrinsic part of it. Agreement-making is happening everywhere. I mean, I'm on the Native Title Service Body. We are making agreements all the time. There are huge, valuable agreements involving hundreds of millions of dollars um, in the Pilgrim in particular. No one, no one turns a hair. And, you know, when the Native Title was repealed by the West Australian Government, as Bjorki Peterson tried to repeal Mabo, you recall, now, when we get a native title determination of the Sun Vast in Western Australia, it gets on page 27 of the paper. It's totally non-contentious. So, what I'm saying is that I think these things all do fit together and precise ordering. I think, I think in the end, the opening up of voice by what the brilliant work that Pat Turner and her colleagues have done really has changed the landscape in a substantial way. And the logic now is that governments are acknowledging that unless Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are at the table, are being heard, are active participants in all this, nothing's going to happen. So I, I'm really trying to leave on a high, high note here. I mean, I spent a lot of time weeping.
because there's still a lot of shit up there, I know that. But there's a lot of very positive stuff. And some of the Aboriginal leadership on this has been fantastic. Um, so, I think you've touched on this quite a bit. My name is Gabby, I'm an animal woman. Um, it's been quite a controversial um, process, the whole, or even just constitutional recognition. Um, it has even shape shifted throughout the last couple of years as well. It was the recognised campaign, and now we're here with a statement to the heart. Um, with one of the latest controversies, which um, Uncle Lyle Munro Jr. was also a part of, was the walk off that happened at Ulara. Um, and that whole voice has been erased and has not been heard of. And I think that's a critical thing that we've got to look at is that many people walked off at Ulara and they were all, uh, majority were East Coast delegates. Um, and there's no air, there's no space for us to talk about the reasons as to why. We all know now there's the statement from the heart and it looks like all delegates were supportive of it when they weren't. Um, we're just seeing rolling ahead with the campaign. Um, one of my biggest concerns is that I don't really think um, it aligns with self-determination. Um, we're not really giving any black fellows any power. We're 5% of the population and we're going to a referendum. Um, that therefore means that we're leading, like we're leading the decision making to the majority. And unfortunately, it's a fact we have to face is that there is a racist leg legacy, which you've touched on. And unfortunately, I, I don't see that we can turn these people um, a big majority. Um, I don't understand why we're giving them power to determine our futures as Aboriginal people. That doesn't seem so, so self-determining when we're only 5%. The, um, if you go back to the Constitution, conventions that set up the Australian Constitution, you don't find a complete agreement there either. It's the nature of human beings to have different views, and we're having different views here tonight. And in my view, I think I said in my address that the one thing I do disagree with with Ken is that there's a consensus outcome here. Because I think there are deeply rooted views which are not going to change. Um, I think the the challenge for um, getting any form of constitutional recognition is whatever is proposed will never be perfect. And there will always be discordant both voices and the differing voices, I don't mean discordant in a critical sense, there will be differing views. And maybe that will paralyse the system because the opponents of recognising Aboriginal people will seize on those divisions and use them against whatever is being put forward. Now that's a tricky because you can't ask Aboriginal people to have a fake agreement, but I think there are very difficult questions for Indigenous people in this. Um, who, who do you want to speak for you? Who do you want to acknowledge as your leaders? And I mean, it's incredibly difficult because we were talking today, looking at that map of the, the tribes of Australia and the Wiradjuri. Did you say Wiradjuri? I mean, I was looking for the name of an Aboriginal lawyer who's working on the governance structure. How do you have a governance structure for the Wiradjuri nation when there is such a huge diaspora? And these are really practical, difficult questions that you've raised. And in a way, you've got to find the answers. Because an answer that's imposed by me is just the latest bit of colonialism. I mean, it is. I mean, I, I now understand that I have to be responding to an Aboriginal voice or I'm just another colonist. So I'm responding at the moment to Aboriginal voices that make sense to me. And you talk about accountability. The thing I really like about what Pat Turner's doing and what she's achieved at the Council of Australian Governments and what she convinced the Prime Minister today to back is that she represents a vast army of organisations through which Aboriginal people find their voices now the medical services, the, all those different community services which are democratically controlled by Aboriginal people and Aboriginal people, that's people. So 
So in a way I see this as a really important bridge which does mean that that multiplicity of voices can be heard through that, through that mechanism. Now that's never going to be perfect either. I mean, I'd be lying if I thought that there was total accord among the peak bodies on every issue and every time. That, that's not going to happen. It's not human nature for that to happen. But I am actually pretty satisfied that that's a very large, we call it democratic input from the indigenous community. The other point I make is that nobody is saying this is the final word. Money has been set aside, and what the select, the joint select committee, the parliamentary committee said, was there was a need for further consultation. There was a really splendid article in the Australian recently by a journalist I really respect, uh, Amos Hakeman, who said he'd just done a trip through, and these people hadn't heard, and they hadn't been told, and blah blah. Perfectly true. Very good article, as he always writes, in my view, very good stuff. But the fact is, there is now going to be another formal process which enables voices to be heard. And you can, I mean I would simply ask you to be alert to that process and to use it as an opportunity because it will be a chance for you and for all these other people who feel they haven't been heard yet to have a say. But uh, I mean I have, uh, I work with some of the people who are rural room um, and I know them, people from my own region, the people whom I live, and I'm you know, pretty satisfied that they are sincere and right, and I know there are dissident voices, that certainly wasn't hidden from me, but um, I think that's the nature of life. And all I can say is, I think it is very challenging, and the Wiradjuri are a very good example. It's far up for an old white guy to say, I believe in First Nations. I believe they're a permanent part of this country. I believe that Mabo locks them in as part of the legal framework. But that requires them to act in ways which say we are who we say we are and we have some sort of thing that binds us together. Now the people I work with in the central desert are of course in a totally different environment. For them, the law is the thing that's much more important than all this other stuff we talk about, housing and education and jobs. If you really ask them, a friend of mine said they'd really like us just to go away and to carry on their lives in the desert. Uh, you know, and, and that's very different from the East Coast here, and it's very different from the North and the West Coast. And it's very different. I mean, the circumstances are so varied. But I think that whether or not the nations survive is entirely in your hands. It's really a question of whether you believe you are part of an entity as against being an individual Australian equal citizen with Aboriginal inheritance. And maybe I'm doing what a big critic of the whole Aboriginal industry, Gary John says, I'm indulging in a white man's dreaming. So I, mean, I think these are not easy, but the answers come from you, not from me. That's what I'm saying. Mm. Time-wise, well, sorry, my answers to questions are always too long. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sound like a politician, but, uh, but can I say, um, I think it's uh, Rachana, you have provided a deep and long reflection on the journey. I think you've clearly said there's more to be done. I think without doubt, if we think about that 1967 referendum, the one citizenship aspect, as you said, over 90% of the population at that time agreed, and I'm sure it would be very similar today. I think you've articulated the issues around collective identity, and as the last questioner put forward, that collective identity is complex with so many different nations, tribes. The Euro statement has suddenly been put forward as one solution but the glacial change, the pace of change, is what really hurts. And I think you've reflected that in your journey. I'd like to actually do two things. First of all, to formally thank the Honourable Fred Cheney for his words. Please show our appreciation. Secondly, I'm going to run through 
a very quickly some, some other thank yous, because events like this don't just happen. Starting with Uncle Colin, we always appreciate uh, as an on-campus elder and your, your support as uh, our other elders who are here tonight. And Marcel Burns. Um, Marcel still with us? Marcel? I did it. Right at the back. Marcel is one of our uh, lecturers in law, but also an amazing uh, indigenous woman who has really advised and helped devise within our curriculum and uh, in fact has had a major impact nationally on law curriculums from an indigenous perspective. I've already mentioned Greg Khan, social professor in law who is responsible for putting together these major events. Greg, thank you for all your hard work behind the scenes. Um, social professor Guy Charlton, right at the back, we established this year when Michael Kirby was here for the Kirby Lecture, a first People's Rights and Law Centre. It's still in its very early stages, so we're still in the midst of consultation. But some of these topics, as Fred Chaney has indicated, we'll be able to do. But, but I but notice the phraseology of First Nations. It also deals with um, issues of Indigenous people in Taiwan and Maoris in New Zealand and uh, Native Americans in the United States, as well as other, other jurisdictions. And so, Guy, if you're interested in involved in sort of the research side of things, you'll be in some practicalities. Also, the law school's professional staff all work very hard behind the scenes to make these things happen, as well as uh, UNE in general. But last and mostly, again, thank you for Mrs. Angela Cheney coming. And Fred, we very much appreciate your time and effort coming from WA to share your wisdom. Thank you very much for coming this evening as um, our town gown event for the Savannah Kiddo 2019 lecture. Thank you.